Sir Ellis Emmanuel Innocent Clark, TC, GCB, GCMG, was the second and last Governor General of Trinidad and Tobago and the first President of this twin island state. Born in 1917, he saw this country move from crown colony to self-governance through independence to republicanism. Today, at 91 years old, he reflects on his life in the public and the private spheres. From 1988, for about 10 years, I was a legal consultant. I had an office on 16 Frederick Street, and I did a certain amount of legal work. Mainly after that, but at some stage during that as well, I was involved with a number of organizations. Families in Action, Habitat, Finbar and Geriatric Home. Oh, I'm team. I've tried to shed most of them now. After all, I do deserve in my time of life a little leisure where I can simply sit and think. He is of a different generation. 91 years old, I think uh, Ulrich Cross is also 90, 91 years old, and is as sprightly as ever, even more sprightly than Felix. Lady Victoria Hannes was 102 when she died. Another, shall I say, I can't say she's a great friend of mine, she's an aunt, you know, aunt in the comes, aunt to me, and uh, a lady in all the senses of the word. You have Lady Hennings, you have Sir, Sir Ellis. That era is going. Only a few of them are left. I grew up in Belmont. I was born in Belmont. In fact, I can tell you precisely where I was born in Belmont. It was the northwestern corner of Pelham Street and Milet Street. And after that, I lived in about six different places in Belmont so that I, I, I can say I spent the first 19 years or so of my life in Belmont. When I was young my mother had a private school and gave some music lessons too. My father was in the civil service in the registrar and marshals department. In those days there would have been the normal activities you know of you pitch marbles, you spin a top, you play some sort of bat and ball, and all the things that were natural and normal to youngsters at that time. There was no television to look at. When I left my mother's private school at age seven, I went to what was then called Christian Brothers. It became later Belmont Intermediate and I think it's now called Belmont Secondary. At Belmont Intermediate, Sir Ellis Clark sat the exhibition exam four times, but contrary to popular belief, he did not win an exhibition. I have known Sir Ellis since we were both 11 years of age. We both got into St. Mary's College. I think I got in a few months before him. I got in in September, 1928. Gosh, that's a long time ago, isn't it? I began aiming for a scholarship, a junior certificate. That was, by the time I sat for juniors, that would have been 1932, and then I won the House Scholarship that year. In 1933, I won the Silver Medal, so I was even more intense then on winning the Island Scholarship. As a matter of necessity, let me see, not as a matter of choice. Although he didn't win an exhibition to enter secondary school, Sir Ellis Clark had a brilliant career at St. Mary's College, winning several academic awards from 1932 to 1936. The first imperative was to win a scholarship. That was the important thing. And I chose the particular field in which I was most likely to win the scholarship. I wasn't thinking of doing something that was conducive to doing law. Uh, that what I was doing was trying to win a scholarship. He knew that when he was growing up, he had to do it. He had to win a scholarship, and he was very focused on winning a scholarship. 
And I think that he felt that um, there were many areas of life that he missed out on, you know. Not that he was ever a great sportsman or had any desire to be, but I think he would have enjoyed the opportunity to play more sports. And I think he would have enjoyed the opportunity perhaps to play a musical instrument or to do other things. And he missed out on those things because he had to focus on the academic side of life. In 1936, Sir Ellis Clark won an open scholarship in mathematics, and in 1937, he went to London to study law at University College London. Upon completing a Bachelor of Law degree, Sir Ellis Clark was called to the bar at Gray's Inn. He graduated with first class honors. It was more than challenging. It was it was not only even bewildering, it was painful. Uh, I began to exercise only on the 1st of September, and in December, I had to go to hospital. I was there for five weeks. When I came out in January, of course, you're not earning, remember, at that time, but you're paying rent for your chambers, you're paying your telephone bill, you're paying your clerk. And when you come out in January, every solicitor passes by and says, Oh, so you're out of hospital. It's so good. And then they add, You have a brilliant future ahead. Don't do too much yet. And you want to tell them, I have no future ahead because I'm not going to survive for a future ahead at this rate. I'm getting on to a year in practice now, you know, and wondering how long will this torture continue of not knowing what money you're going to earn next month or what's going to happen. And I got a message that a very prominent, very, uh, a man in high position, he, he was the Crown Solicitor, but much more than that, had direct access to the governor and so on and so on. And he summoned me and I quaked and I wondered what had I done wrong? What was he going to reprove me about? And then I found, uh, when I went in, that he offered me a job to be a legal advisor to the food controller. So there, there, there was a, a price control over a huge range of, of articles in Trinidad and Tobago in 1949, just four years after the war. And Ellis drafted most of the legislation. Yes, so I, I did very well. I was paid the same salary that a magistrate would be paid, except that a magistrate had to be 10 years in practice. And I was allowed my private practice as well. And I was given work by the Crown, by the Crown Solicitor to do civil matters, and by the Attorney General's Department to do prosecutions. And I suddenly became somebody who was quite well off by the standards of those days. There was a transformation. I got married in 19, I was a discreet young man. I didn't get married until I could support a wife. In those days you did not marry a wife who could support you. But, um, so I had to wait until I was, what, 34? Oh, exactly 34 and a half, come to think of it. I got married in 1952. I always worked closely with the Crown. I prosecuted at the Assizes, I did civil work for the Crown. I was chairman of the first wages council in Trinidad and Tobago. And, uh, I had been made offers before. I was offered a magistracy. I was offered a post of assistant to the Attorney General. It seemed that I was destined to work for this crown. I was being tossed about by the waves of fortune. Uh, I, I was never applied for a post and I never sought anything. I, every post I've held I've been offered, including the post of Chief Justice, which I never took up. Trinidad and Tobago was among several countries that sought to bring about a referendum to achieve independence for the region. As a result of the Jamaican referendum, 
the Federation was in grave danger. For many, many years in the West Indies, there had been talk of Federation. For decades before it occurred, people from the different islands, including old Mary Shaw and lots of other people, had the idea of what was then known as, um, well, being the same status, shall I say, as Canada or Australia. We were such tiny places that it was felt we could only achieve this by getting together and becoming a viable entity. So that Federation was, I think, regarded mainly, this is my view, it's not the generally accepted view, uh, as a means to an end. You wanted uh, to get a certain status, to get to independence, and you couldn't get it individually, and so you would get it collectively. Then one or two rather small countries, but bigger than any of ours, got independence. And therefore it meant that Jamaica could get its independence, independently of the Federation. And Jamaica opted for that course. Now, some 70% of the federal budget was born by Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. Percentage-wise, Trinidad was paying more than Jamaica, but Jamaica, being twice the size of Trinidad, was paying de facto a little more than Trinidad, but much less per head of population. If Jamaica left, the whole burden would have fallen on Trinidad. I took the view that it was in the best interests of everybody that we should not defer our becoming independent until we had formed an association with one or more of the other territories that had belonged to the Federation. Now, most or perhaps all of the other territories and all the officers of the Federation expected that Trinidad and Tobago would simply continue in the Federation despite the secession, you might call it, of Jamaica. Trinidad and Tobago did not follow this course, and there was quite a bit of bitter feeling on the part of most of the other territories to Trinidad and Tobago, and it hasn't all evaporated yet, despite all that Trinidad and Tobago has done for them. My own view was that we'd have all been in a muddle and got exactly nowhere if we had remained trying to patch up a federation without Jamaica. And therefore, we decided to become independent. But, and this is the part that's left out. People just say, we decided to become independent. We decided to become independent, offering one or more of the other units of the Federation to join us in whatever association they wished, be it a unitary state, be it a federation, be it a confederation, or anything else. So we did not abandon them. What happened is that instead of all of us drowning, we kept our head above water and could at least try and save them as we've been trying to do all these years. Sir Ellis Clark is well known for his involvement in drafting the initial independence constitution. This draft was modeled after constitutions of countries which had become independent at that time. It is often assumed that Sir Ellis drafted both the independence and republican constitutions. The constitution that I did the first draft of is the constitution, what we call the independence constitution. 
1976, we got the Republican Constitution, which is the one that is in force today. I was not really the draftsman of the, of the Republican Constitution, though everybody attributes it to me. I was, at that time, Governor General. And the person who did the, in the Republican Constitution was the Chief Parliamentary Council. Although Sir Ellis Clark was appointed Chief Justice in April 1961, he never, in fact, assumed that post. Shortly before our formal accession to independence, it was felt that my association with the executive had been so close in making all the preparations for independence that I should not really assume the post of Chief Justice. And I was delighted because I had tasted a little of the ambassadorial life in Washington. And although law has always been my first love, I certainly didn't mind a flirtation with diplomacy. One of the main architects of the 1962 Independence Constitution, Sir Ellis Clark attended the Marlboro House Conference in June of that year. This conference led to Trinidad and Tobago gaining independence. So that was the Marlboro House. Led by the Secretary of State for the Colonies and all his advisors and the government of the day, Eric Williams and his ministers, and the leader of the opposition, Rudranath Kapildeo, and all his supporters. And I was there as constitutional advisor to the cabinet. I was sitting between Rudranath Kapildeo and Eric Williams, and some of Kapildeo's remarks would have been unprintable. But Eric Williams probably didn't hear them because he had his hearing aid on the other side. I was the buffer between the two of them. But the government wanted something, and the opposition wanted something else, and everybody got annoyed with me. The opposition felt that I should see their point of view. The government said I should support them. I was, after all, constitutional advisor of the cabinet. And I kept my cool and said nothing. So it wasn't allowed to reach deadlock. With their usual technique, the British had a tea break. And everybody caught up. And most people in a huff and a puff. By the time we returned, everything was hanky-dory. Apparently, Bill Williams had said to Rudy Capildeo, look here, we are the only two intelligent people here. Why can't we settle it? But there are the others. And Capildeo said, but of course. And we had hardly anything more to do. The conference was virtually attended prematurely. That was the dramatic closure of the conference. After independence, Sir Ellis Clark was appointed ambassador to the United States of America and permanent representative to the United Nations. Later, he also became Trinidad and Tobago's representative on the Council of the Organization of American States, as well as ambassador to Mexico. His career as a diplomat ended in 1972 when he returned home to succeed Sir Solomon Ho Choi as Governor General. He held this post for three years. Sir Ellis Clark also holds the distinction of being bestowed with several honors, including knighthood, and was among the first to be awarded Trinidad and Tobago's highest honor, the Trinity Cross. When Trinidad and Tobago became a republic in 1976, Sir Ellis Clark was unanimously elected as the country's first president by the Electoral College which comprised both Houses of Parliament. I, Ellis Emmanuel Innocent Clark, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago and to the best of my ability preserve and defend the Constitution and the law, that I will conscientiously and impartially discharge the functions of President and will devote myself to the service 
and well-being of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So help me God. I assumed a duty on the 31st of January, uh, 73, and it ceased when we became a republic in 76. There was an immediate transition then. At midnight, I ceased to be governor, governor general, and immediately thereafter became president. And I was president until an election was held, and I was elected president in 77 for a five-year term. And then I was re-elected in 82, and I demitted office in 87. While in office, Sir Ellis Clark had the rare experience of having to appoint a successor to the Prime Minister after the demise of Dr. Eric Williams. The death of Eric Williams was quite sudden. I had heard on the Friday that he didn't seem to be well in Parliament. I made inquiries about his health condition on the Saturday, and on the Sunday early evening, I was told by a minister, tearfully, that the Prime Minister was dying. He was almost incoherent, this minister who gave me that information. And I said, my friend, you are telling me he's dying, but from what I gather, he may be dead. Will you please go back and find out whether he's dying or is dead? Because if he's dying, I have to take one course of action. And if he's dead, I have to take a different course of action. And because the Prime Minister was dead, I had to appoint, according to the Constitution, the leader in the House of the party with a majority of votes. Now, since he was dead, there was no leader in the House, the PNM having a majority of seats. And the provision then goes on to say, if there is no leader, then you appoint the person who, in your opinion, is most likely to command the support of a majority of the members of the House. And I had to act under that limb of the Constitution. I invited for consultation the chairman of the party and the three deputies. And after hearing their views, even particularly their indecision, I talked to certain other prominent members of the party, and I was led to believe that the party, or the members of the party in the House, would give their support to George Chambers. I therefore had no option but to appoint George Chambers. Sir Ellis Clark was married to Lady Ermintrude Clark for almost 50 years. They had three children, Peter Clark, Margaret Ann, and Richard, who died as a young child. Today, Sir Ellis has five grandchildren. Religion has been a very important, a most decisive part of my life. Now, I'm not saying that I have been as good a Catholic as I ought to have been. I'm not saying that I was perfect in the practice of my religion. What I am saying is that my fundamental beliefs are those of my religion. I regard the practice of religion as the most important aspect of my life. I'm not applying for sainthood or anything like that. But I am saying that I recognize the importance of religion. Generosity, I think, is, is, uh, is something that uh, he takes very seriously and, and helping others. Um, and uh, as I say, he has, he has done more than his fair share in his life. Uh, usually, as I say, quietly, um, without any publicity, without anyone knowing. My father's never been much of a sportsman, but there are two sports that I must say he's always enjoyed. One was boxing. Not that he ever participated in boxing, but he used to enjoy watching boxing. And the other was, of course, horse racing. 
um, and he's, he's enjoyed horse racing for at least the last 30 years. Um, at one stage, we had a number of horses uh, racing in Trinidad and Tobago, and I know he got a lot of joy from that. He used to, um, often on mornings, uh, stop at the paddock in Port of Spain um, early in the morning at 6 or 6.30 and, and look at the horses, train or visit the horses. And of course, he was a regular at uh, race meets um, for many, many years on, on a Saturday. He included me uh, among his four uh, colleagues who owned several horses. That's why I'm going back now to the 1970s. And we had about four or five horses. And luckily enough, they were all great winners, uh, particularly uh, some horse, horse fans will remember the great Clung Prince, who was called the People's Horse, if only because he was always on the tins, and therefore they couldn't lose their money on, on a bet on Clung Prince. But we were. We were not gamblers. I don't think we would spend more than $20 on a race. That was not the interest. It was love of the game, love of the sport, and love of celebrating the wins with a one or two or three or four or five or more champagnes at the end of the evening. It wouldn't be all work and no play. For instance, if you speak of social activities, I certainly enjoyed dancing. And I would not be lacking in humility if I said that I was a good, a very good, dancer because humility is truth and if I said I was a good sportsman it would not be humility or, or anything it would be stupidity so if I say that I was a good dancer this is what I was in my day From humble beginnings in Belmont, Sir Ellis Clark worked hard and often in challenging circumstances. With a career that spanned over four decades, he remains a measured voice of reason, noted for his tact and wit. A statesman who has served his country with distinction and who bore his honors and high offices exceptionally well. It is almost impossible to overstate Ellis's contribution to the development of Trinidad and Tobago has been an immense contribution. And I gather he's still contributing. <laughs> Although he has dined and wined with kings and queens and princes and princesses, he still does not lose the common touch. And uh, he's a humble man. And that humility makes him endearing to those who know him well.